<clears throat> All right, Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this time that you have carved out for us to be able to dig into your word. And it's awesome, Lord. It is so good to, to dig into the book of Genesis and to see creation as you made it. Um, you speak and things happen. And it's, sometimes it's hard for us to understand how it all unfolds, but it doesn't mean that it wasn't true or that's exactly how it happens. And so, God, as we go through your word today, help us to be students. Help us to be, um, help us to have confidence that, God, your word is true. Your word is good. It is edifying. It is correcting. It is there to guide. It is there to direct and that it doesn't hide. And so, Lord, we can bring all of our questions to you and to your word, and so we're thankful for it. As we um, move through this book, we pray that you would be our guide. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So today we are um, we're going to work our way through chapter 1, and um, the title of our time is going to be The Designer Knows His Design. The designer knows his design. And, um, you know, it's interesting because we're about to kind of dig into kind of the great dilemma. And I, I would imagine that each one of us has run into the great dilemma at some point or the scientific showdown or whatever it is you want to call it. For most of us, I'm going to guess that it happened somewhere in middle school or early high school when you went into biology class. Right and, and at that point, science came up against the Bible. Um, biology came up against Christianity. God came up against Darwin. And for each one of us, um, sadly, I think that we're still trying to figure out how to answer what was brought up that day. Because if it's anything like it was for me, for you, science teacher opened you know, your biology book, and you opened up to the chapter on origin. Probably sounded something like this, you know, evolution, and this is how it's defined in the encyclopedia. It's the theory in biology postulating that the various types of plants, animals, and other living things on earth have their origin in other pre-existing types, and that the distinguishable differences are due to modifications in successive generations. The theory of evolution is one of the foundational keystones of modern biological theory right we're typically presented with something like that that this is the cornerstone of biology this is one of the the major foundations of science and at that point fifth sixth seventh eighth ninth grade we're trying to figure out what in the world just happened because although there's some really interesting words that they pick there basically what they're saying is you as a person came from an ape and an ape came back to the same place that plants came from. And we all came from a series of events over a long period of time. And that's how you were created. <clears throat> God comes straight up against science. And I think for most of us, we're still trying to figure out what do we do with that? Because I, as I look around at what's happening in our country, I think most of us believed it that day. Right? We, we looked on at what Darwin had taught or what our ninth grade teacher had taught us, and we go, that's true. And at the time, we don't understand the consequences because it's just science. It's just evolution. It's just a theory. But we don't think of it as a theory. If you go back and read that, how in the world is biology, modern biology, a key fundamental is based off of a theory? It's all the theory. It, it very well could be wrong, and but it's placed there, and we're the ones that grew up in the church. We're going, but what about God? What about creation? Oh, those are, you know, and, and it probably the thinking goes, well, those are just kind of like the fairy tales, kind of like Easter Bunny. And you almost put them in a place where you go, boy, I don't exactly know what to do with them. But let me pause for a minute and just ask you this question. Okay, last week we did one verse. We spent a whole entire study on one verse about God being the creator. And just put that over here for a minute. And I want to ask you, if you were Satan, 
and you didn't like how things are with God, how would you attack that one verse? How would you attack what we're about to go through in chapter 1? Evolution, as we talked about at the end of Revelation, right? Satan started this thing called religion. It's man's way of basically worshiping himself, and it comes off as religion. And we as Christians, we're not into religion. We're into a relationship. And science and Darwin, they're part of that religion. If you were going to discredit a creator, you would take away the creator. And you would take us back to chance. And millions of years and just random things coming together. That's if I were Satan. That's probably what I would do. You see, not everybody that believes in evolution understands that once they've believed in that, they've taken away their ability to believe in Jesus. You go, Ben, there's so many Christians that believe in evolution. If you take that card out, the whole stack falls. You can't have both. You go, well, wait, wait a minute. Are you telling me that evolution is a, it's a theory? It's a theory. It's a guess. And right in front of us, where we read last week, you've got to figure out if this is going to be a theory or if this is going to be fact. Because you're going to find that you can't have both. You say, but man, I love science. What if I told you that you can have science and God? What if I told you that Charles Darwin came up for, uh, with a way for evolution to take over and hijack science, but it doesn't have to be that way. The unbelieving science community has created a path for science. I have no idea how they've conquered the market like they have, but they've created a curriculum where they have tried to own biology. But it's based off of theories. But what if I told you that science and God can work together? What if I told you that God not only loves science, but he asks you to come and ask questions about it? If you flip to Isaiah chapter 40, listen to how God talks about creation and puts almost a challenge right into our laps. Now, as you listen to this, I want you to think, does God sound like he's afraid to ask your questions about evolution? Listen to what it says in Isaiah 40. We'll go down to verse 12. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, measured heaven with a span, and calculated the dust of the earth in a measure, weighed the mountains on scales and hills in a balance? Who has directed the spirit of the Lord, or as his counselor has taught him? With whom did he take counsel, and who instructed him and taught him the path of justice? Who taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? Behold, the nations are a drop in a bucket, and he counted them as the small dust on the scales." So you could put United States in there. You could put whatever grand government in there. It's a drop in the bucket, right? It was awesome. Look, he lifted up the isles as a very little thing, and Lebanon is not sufficient to burn, nor its be sufficient for a burnt offering. All nations before him are as nothing, and they are counted by him less than nothing and worthless. To whom then will, God, will you liken God, or what likeness will you compare him? The workman molds the image. The goldsmith spreads, overspreads it with gold. And the silversmith casts silver change. Whoever is too impover- impoverished for such a contribution, choose a tree that will not rot. He seeks for himself a skillful workman to prepare a carved image that will not totter. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told to you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth. Okay, so for all you flat earthers, that's a difficult one because in the book of Isaiah, it shows us that it's circular. And its inhabitants are like grasshoppers who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. He brings the princes to nothing. He makes the judges of the earth useless. Now, does that sound like a God that's afraid of a couple ninth grade biology questions? No. He actually puts it right back on us. Who? Who did this? Like he did to Job. Job, were you there when? The same exact thing when it comes to science. Guys, my hope for you today isn't to prove that evolution is false and make you believe 
that God, God's plan for creation is what to believe. My hope for you today is for you to have hope again in science and learning that God's word is true and it can defend itself and that you can believe in Jesus and science. My hope is that you enjoy researching creation and God and don't be afraid to go back on the attack. Charles Darwin said in his book, The Origin of Species, it could be demonst- if it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. So Darwin says, listen, if there's a kink in this, it's going to break apart real quick. And we've started to see that. Darwin's theory is not as strong as science the science community used to think. He's having a lot of problems. But the Lord sits just as it talks about in Isaiah and says, come on, bring your questions. Darwin knew that he could never explain the designer, which means that he didn't truly ever understand the design. As we look around at all these things that we have so many questions about, just try to explain the complexity of an eyeball and you'll get lost. But if you believe Genesis 1-1, it becomes very, very easy. So let's go back to Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Guys, we have a creator. We have a designer, and he knows his design. We don't have to go any down any theories. It's right there. It says, The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the of the waters. So let's break that down for a minute. The earth was. The earth was. Does anybody have another translation of a different word there for was? Does anybody have and? So some translations, I believe the King James, it has an and there. So it would read, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth and the earth was without form and void. I have a new King James. Mine doesn't say and, but I, I really enjoy that, the King James translation of and. Because when we were talking about last week at the end, this gap between verses 1 and 2, the and sure makes those flow together quite easily. <clears throat> the conjunction Hebrew word there is W-A-W, which typically would come over as an and. If the gap theory was true and there were, you know, a thousand years or 10,000 years or millions of years between verses 1 and 2, then you would expect either an explanation here or there wouldn't be something like an and to, to bring 1 and 2 together. So again, there's a, as we ended by talking about the gap theory last week, it's hard because you would expect something to be talked about there. If fossils were put in there, if the fall of Satan was put in there, you would expect something doesn't seem that way especially as you just read it right through so earth is earth is created now it's not without um it's not without form yet but here's just a couple fun facts about earth that i think are very interesting to look at and again it's so much easier to understand earth as knowing that the creator created it Dwayne uh, gish in his book on creation he said there are 350 million cubits cubit miles of water on the earth But there is not a single liquid drop of water anywhere else in the galaxy. So there's all this water on earth, but not a single drop anywhere else. Say, okay, that sounds cool. Well, listen, since the invention of the telescope, scientists have estimated there are 100 billion stars in each galaxy. And they've also believed that there's 100 billion galaxies within the universe. That's a lot of stars. That's a lot of planets. That's a lot of possibilities. And there isn't a single drop of water on any other planet, on any other star, on any other moon. 100% of the water in the universe is on planet Earth. Come on. The design, the designer knows his design. Earth is made up of 21% life-giving oxygen. There's not an ounce of oxygen on any other planet. If the earth was 25% oxygen, the earth would burst into flames. 
Sounds like somebody knows what they're doing, right? I mean, I put the, the oven on the wrong temperature and my hash browns don't turn out the right way. God has created this whole entire universe and in not other, one other place is there the perfect living conditions for human beings. The ozone is produced from oxygen. The ozone is toxic to, toxic to humans. Now the sun sends ultraviolet light that kills things. Listen to this. The, o, the ozone absorbs the ultraviolet light so much that the ultraviolet light can't all the way get through. The ozone, although poisonous to humans, surrounds the earth 10 miles away where it can filter out the ultraviolet rays, but the poisonous things don't, but the poisonous ozone doesn't poison the creatures. So there's this ozone that's poisonous for us, but protects us. Isn't that wild? The earth is at a 20, 23 degree angle. Because of that angle, the earth rotates and creates seasons. If it wasn't on an angle of 23 degrees, the United States would be in a year-long winter. We wouldn't be able to grow crops. So for all of us gardeners and farmers, the earth is tilted so that we could feed ourselves. It sure does seem like the design is pointing to the designer. It also says without form and void. <clears throat> without form and void. Now, Henry Morris points out that the gap theory here suggests that these words really should be translated ruined and desolate. So if you believe in the gap theory, you look on and say the earth was ruined and desolate. Now, this theory is that destruction had happened. It also, again, makes it very difficult to explain fossils. Because if everything was ruined and broken, then fossils wouldn't be put together. It would be like after a bomb has gone off trying to say that cars are still being put together. It would actually do the opposite, right? Destroy. The gap theory also places the fall of Satan in this gap. And so this theory comes the timeline for Satan's fall. But again, you have more questions to answer. Again, you can believe in it. I just think that it makes it very difficult. I think this verse is best understood as without form and void. It says, And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. The Spirit of God was hovering over. So we see the Holy Spirit moving in the second verse of the Bible. So first off, we know that God is spiritual. And you say, okay, spiritual. What do you mean by the Holy Spirit? Are we talking about, I've heard that the Holy Spirit is more of an energy. Well, there's, there's some really big problems with that. Because we believe that God is one God in three different persons. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. You say, so you think that the Holy Spirit is a person. Well, he has to be. Listen to some of the attributes. The Holy Spirit teaches, John 14, 26, 1 Corinthians 2, 13, Nehemiah 9, 20. He testifies, he guides, he speaks, he hears, he intercedes, he shows favor, he shows love. Have you ever stuck your finger into an outlet and that electrical system gave you favor or guided you or spoke to you? No, it has no feelings. It just zap. It's very difficult to believe that the Holy Spirit is just a energy. So we see the Holy Spirit hit the scene. <clears throat> Pretty neat to think about that God is working and moving in verse 1 and 2. It then says it's hovering over the face of the waters. This brings up some great questions, right? What waters are we talking about? If God hadn't created the oceans yet, what's the deal? Okay, let's chew on this for a minute. First, water exists in three forms. Liquid, ice, and gas. The water... In the sky is an invisible water vapor until it condenses to form rain. So it could be in one of those three forms, and it is still water. Second, the elements were formed, not yet filled. As Warren Wearsby points out, at this point he is forming, he's not yet filling. Let's think about this as a builder. So when a house is being built, okay, you have your construction site, and all of the different um, things that are used to build a house are delivered. So you have a big pile of bricks and you have siding and 
Then you have somebody that comes out and lays the concrete. Now the elements are there, but the builder hasn't yet put them together. So just because the bricks are in a pile, it doesn't mean that it's not a wall or that walls don't exist. It just means that they haven't been put in their proper place yet. So at this point, we have water. And it's not really that hard to explain that it's just not in its place as we know it yet. So just like a builder, that's what God is doing here. He has a plan. He has a blueprint. Atoms, DNA, bacteria, proteins, they're all evidence of this. The foundation is laid. The materials are stacked. But they have yet to be put into their proper order. Sure does sound like the designer knows his design. Verse 3. Then, it's, then God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light. That it was good. So let's pause right there for a minute. Here from the beginning, we have God speaking his very first words. It's exciting. What does he say? Let there be light. Light is powerful. This is the start of visible waves, which means the electromagnetic spectrum has now been created. The sun is not yet created, but light is created. You say, what does it look like? I don't know. But it's out there and it's moving. Pretty neat nugget is that Jesus is referred to as the light of the world, John 8, 12. In him is no darkness at all. It then says, and God divided the light from the darkness. God divided the light from the darkness. A couple, you know, little nugget here is that God divides. Not always the most popular thing to think about, but man, is it true. Throughout Scripture, God is dividing. You say, Ben, that's not true. John 17, he's, Jesus is praying that the church would come together. Sure. He wanted us to be one. In marriage, he wants us to be one. But if you go from Genesis to Revelation, you are going to see that very often God is separating his people. He divides. He separates. Paul speaks on this topic twice. Well, twice that I could just think of just in a big way. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11. O Corinthians, we have spoken openly to you. Our heart is wide open. You are not restricted by us, but you are restricted, restricted by your own affections. Now in return for the same, you also be open. Do not be unequally yoked to, together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Balo? And what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are a temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. God doesn't have a problem telling us we should be separated. In Ephesians, he says for... <clears throat> For you were once in darkness, but now you are, you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. And have no fellowship with unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. But all things are exposed and are made manifest by the light. For whatever makes manifest is, in, is light. Therefore, he says, awake you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. So God separates. He divides. We as Christians, we should always be used to it. You say, Ben, what does that mean? I thought we were supposed to go and invite people to church that didn't know Jesus. So am I just not supposed to hang out with them? It means that we go into darkness to bring them to light. We've got to be careful with that. Because sometimes we like to hang out in darkness so much that people can't tell that we're the light. Right now, it's a weird time in our country, isn't it? Especially for the church. Because it's hard to tell what's light and darkness. Some people believe some of the Bible, but not other parts. And they're saying, well, this really doesn't mean this, and it's become murky. That's not how God is. It's not how his word is. 
He made light. He separated light from darkness. Let's go into verse 5. God called the, the, God called the light day and darkness he called night. So evening and morning were the first day. All right, a couple nuggets here in verse 5. First, God's defining terms. I don't think we always like God's terms and when he defines things because, you know, we always like to go against it. Well, did he really mean day? Did he really mean night? When he said evening, when he said morning, happened all the time, right? Well, did God really say? Did he really mean that? Who does that sound like? We're going to see this character in a couple weeks who's going to say that to Eve. Did God really mean that? Okay, right here he says, God called the light day and darkness he called night. So evening and morning were the first day. There's an evening, there's a morning, there's a day, there's a night. Now there's another theory that I want to briefly discuss. It's something called day-age theory. And this theory says that it's not a 24-hour period. But it's, you know, it's a thousand, you know, one day is equal to a thousand. Could mean a thousand, could mean a million. Very much like the gap theory, it would give a possibility to some of the questions that we struggle with. But very much like the gap theory, I think it creates more questions than we have answers. Now, some that believe in it, you go, well, hold on a second. In in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, doesn't God say something about um, a thousand days or like a day to God? Yes, but that's a simile. That isn't necessarily saying that going back to Genesis 1-1 says that this is the way that it should go. And you say, okay, but if, I, if, I, if, I'm a, 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 if I'm a day, age theorist, can I still hang out? Yes, absolutely. I think it just makes it really, really hard. Because you're going to have to explain things like redefining these terms. And I've got to tell you when it comes to God's word, I'm very careful about redefining anything. Do I want to go back and say, well, the day, it actually means a thousand years, and evening actually means this, and morning actually means this? We're talking about a God who just makes things out of nothing. So is it hard for him to say, this is my time period? You say, but Ben, the sun hasn't even been created yet, so how do we even have a 24-hour time period? Again, remember, he's a builder. He's a designer. So just because we don't understand the form yet, it doesn't mean that the form isn't already there. Think about our construction house building metaphor. Just because they're a pile of bricks, does that mean that it's not ever going to be a wall? That we should not stop believing in walls? No, just because the sun hasn't been created yet doesn't mean that he's going to place it into a 24-hour period. He could have made it a 72-hour period. He could have made it rotate as fast as he wanted, as slow as he wanted, as big as he wanted. He picked it like this. So why are we going to, why are we going to try to buck something that it seems is very, very obvious? So we have the close of the first day. Let's move on and let's see what happens next in verse 6. Then God said that there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. Thus God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. And God called the firmament heaven. So the evening and the morning were the second day. David Guzik points out here that the firmament, the idea of a firmament is in the NIV, it's it's translated expanse. It's also known as space in the NLT. So the firmament, space, expanse. It says, and let it divide the the waters from the waters. So the water of the land are separated from the water vapor in the sky. Now, I I, want to read to you a little section here. I've been digging into Henry Morris's The Genesis Record. And this is just a, it's a really good read if you really want to dig into it. I there's times where I'm reading this and I, I think I'm going to read this whole entire thing on Sunday to you guys because it's just so good. And there's one section about the firmament that I want to read because I don't think even if I tried, I could sum it up as well as Henry Morris does. Listen to what he says about firmament and just one of the possibilities. The word firmament is the Hebrew R-A-Q-I-A. I'm going to go rakia, meaning expanse or spread out thinness. It may be well synonymous with our modern technological term, space. 
He says, separated by this firmament or atmosphere, the two bodies of water henceforth were ready for their essential, essential functions in the sustaining future, future life on earth. The actual process of separation was possible, implemented by converting a portion of the liquid water into the vapor state, perhaps through application of divine heat energy. He goes on to say the waters above the firmament thus probably constituted a vast blanket of water vapor above the troposphere and possibly above the stratosphere as well. In the high temperature region now known as the ionosphere and extending far into space. It could not have been the clouds of water droplets which now float in the atmosphere because the scripture says they were above the firmament. Furthermore. There was no rain upon the earth in those days, Genesis 2, 5, nor any bow in the sky, Genesis 9, 13, both of which must have been present in these upper waters represented merely the regiment of clouds which function in the present hydro, hydrologic economy. He goes on to say the concept of a water canopy over the earth has appeared in many writings, both ancient and modern. A number of writers have visualized it as a system of rings like those on the planet Saturn, composed possibly of ice particles orbiting the Earth. Others have described it as an orbiting shell of ice or liquid water. He breaks this down. I'm just going to do a couple more because it's really neat. The vapor canopy seems more likely, however, both because of the inferred manner of its foundation and because it would have been transparent in order for the heavenly bodies to give light upon the Earth and to be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years, which we'll see in verse 14 and 15. Water vapor, even in vast amounts, is invisible, whereas clouds, fog, and so forth are composed of minute droplets of liquid water and therefore are opaque. Furthermore, a vapor canopy could be more easily maintained aloft and would serve much more effectively as a marvelous sustainer of vigorous life conditions on the earth. It can be shown that such a canopy would accomplish the following services, for, for example. Now, anybody who's wondering how people live to be 900 years old, listen to what would come as a benefit of this so-called water canopy. First, since the water canopy has the ability to both transmit incoming solar radiation and retain, and retain the disperse much of the radiation reflected from the Earth's surface, it would serve as a global greenhouse. Maintaining an essential uniformity, pleasing warm temperature all over the world. Well, that would explain why some tropical plants have been found in places that aren't tropical. Wouldn't it be nice if Tiffin became like 75 year round? Hallelujah. Hallelujah, right? We wouldn't have to move to the beach. We'd have it right here. With, this is the second thing that, that this would make. With nearly uniform temperature, great air mass movements would be inhibited and windstorms would be unknown. Be no wind. Very interesting. With no global air circulation, the, high, the hydrologic cycle of the present world could not be intimate, implemented and there could be no rain except directly over the bodies of water for which it might have evaporated. So that would explain that. Next, the planet would have been maintained not only at uniform temperatures, but also at a comfortable uniform humidities by means of daily local evaporation and condensation in each day-night cycle. So not only would it be nice temperature, but it wouldn't be that humid. i got three more. I'm going to share them all because they're good. <clears throat> The combination of warm temperature and adequate moisture everywhere would be conducive later to extensive stands of lush vegetation all over the world with no barren deserts or ice caps. Vapor canopy, I said I have three more, I got, I got three more now. The vapor canopy would also be highly effective in filtering out ultraviolet radiation, cosmic rays, and other destructive energies from outer space. These are known to be the source of both Somatic and genetic mutations which decrease the viability of the individual and the species respectively. Thus, the canopy would contribute effectively to human and animal health and longevity. 
Okay, so that, that helps explain things. Some have objected to the idea of a heavy water canopy because the great increase in atmospheric pressure would cause at the Earth's which it would cause at the Earth's surface. Rather than being a problem, however, this effect would contribute still further to health and longevity. Modern biomedical research is increasingly proving that such hyperbaric pressures are very effective in combating disease and in promoting good health generally. I don't know if you've ever looked at hyperbaric chambers and what they're used for these days, but they take the the oxygen level up to, I believe, 23% which is what it's believed if this canopy were there. So athletes right now, when they get hurt, they go into these chambers to go back to this exact state. All right, last one. Who knows, whenever you hear LeBron James is in one of these chambers, you can go, dude, you're going back to the beginning, to the canopy. Later, when needed, these upper waters would provide the the reservoir for which God would send a great flood to save the godly remnant from the hopelessly corrupt population of the day. So, we have a possibility of a canopy, which sure would explain a lot. You say, but what about, you know, the, there's a lot of creation scientists that believe that there's no way. Sure, there's a lot of different options. Again, there's a lot of different problems. Would it have been too hot if we would have had this water canopy? Who knows? But there was a firmament. And it sure does point to a design, knowing a designer, knowing his design. Let's go to verse 9. Then God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth and the gathering together of the waters he called the sea. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb that yields seed. And the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind, whose seed is, is in itself on the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, the herb that yields seed according to its kind, and the tree that yields fruit, whose seed is in itself according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. So the evening and the morning were the third day. I love day three. We got apple trees. A couple things to notice here. The plants were created not as seeds, but as plants. You go, man, that's really hard to understand. Listen, Adam is going to be created as a full man, not a baby. Seeds are put in place for the purpose of reproduction. Pretty neat how God set up this way of reproducing. And he says this thing according to its kind. Now for us, that's very, very important. What that means is... We're going to stay in our kind, and we're not going to transfer over to another kind. So that means that a dog may have come from another dog. Like a Dalmatian would have come from a Great Dane, which came from a Weimariner. There's movement within there, but a dog can't become a turtle. And And a dog didn't come from a fish. It has to stay in its kind. So that means that human beings are part of their kind. Dogs are part of their kind. Cats are a part of their kind. I don't know why we created cats or mosquitoes, but they have their own kind. Plants, grass, they have their own kinds. Grass didn't turn into a plant, which turned into a tree, which turned into a... No, they have their kind. A couple big questions that we would have to answer at this point... If the sun has not yet been created, how do the plants live? You say, Ben, for Pete's sake, what about photosynthesis? That's a great question. Photosynthesis, the complicated process that all life is dependent on energy from the sun. You say, how is photosynthesis possible without the sun? We already have the sun. God is already there. Jesus Christ is already there. and We already know that he's a life form. We just got done with the book of Revelation where there is no sun. And everybody is sustained by God who is the light. So even though the sun isn't there, the sun is there. So at that point, plants are dependent off of energy from God. Not that hard to believe, right? It kind of all just starts fitting together. So think of, Gen- or think of Revelation 20, 22 as you look at Genesis. The designer 
knows the design. Let's keep going. Verse 14. Then God said, let there be light in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night. And let them be signs for seasons and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth. And it was so. Then God made two great lights. The greater light to rule the day, the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. God set them into the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. So evening and morning were the fourth, were, were the fourth day. So here we have the creation of sun. We have the moon. We have the stars. Kind of a couple of neat little fun nuggets about the sun. The sun accounts for 998 percent of the mass in the solar system it has a mass of around 330,000 times of that the earth over 1 million earths could fit inside the sun temperature inside the sun I have no idea how people come up with this they reach 15 million degrees celsius so we have the sun and there's just so many wild statistics about the sun and I have to tell you some of the places where I got these statistics also say that it's 4 billion years old. So if we're off by a couple of million degrees, somewhere around there, right? We also have the stars and the moon. We've got to be aware of how much we get into the stars. Beware of astrology. As Pastor David Guzik points out, astrology is a satanic corruption of God's original message in the stars. A message outlining his plan of redemption. Because of astrology is a corruption, it should be avoided always by man. She said, what does that mean? Does that mean I can't be into horoscopes? You should not be into horoscopes. You know, but I, I, I check it all the time. Why? We have the creator. We have the designer. Why would we look to the stars for this sequence that would point us to some of them are just so funky too, right? Even we were, I was trying to explain to my kids about fortune cookies the other day, and I was just like, it's, it's hard, right? You open these things up, and who knows what it'll tell you. Your lucky numbers are this, that, and whatsoever. And, and it says you are you, you accept yourself or something. And fortune cookies, it seems, are going, anywho. <clears throat> But when we read these things, we go, oh, that sounds good. Maybe that applies to my life. Can you imagine making a life decision based off a horoscope or a fortune cookie or something like that? When right in front of you, you have God's word that says it's a light. It's a, a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. You don't have to do horoscopes because you've got the real deal. We don't have to get into bootleg things because we have the authentic, true God. Let's keep going. Verse 20. Then God said, let the waters abound with the abundance of living creatures and let the birds fly above the earth across the face of the firmament of the heavens. So God created the great sea creatures and every living thing that moves from which the waters abounded according to its kind and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good and God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply <clears throat> and fill the waters of the sea and let the birds multiply on the earth. So the evening and the morning we're the fifth day. So we have the creation of animals, birds, sea creatures. Oh, we're going to get the rest of them here a bit. Now, the theory of evolution claims that life happened just over a long course of time. That matter just evolved. Atoms just formed over time. Bacteria formed and evolved over time. The issue with this is that science becomes very hard to prove by science. Let me show you. The most simple atoms are very complex, and the more complex atoms are incredibly complex. If you were to think back on building a house, what are the chances that over the course of a thousand years, if all of those materials were laid at where a house is being built, over the course of a thousand years, what are the chances of that house building itself? What if I gave you 10,000 years or 100,000 years or a million gazillion trillion? What are the chances that, that, that a tornado is just going to come sweeping through, put all those bricks together, put your porch just as you want, a his and her closets? 
We would look on and we'd say, Ben, you're insane. It is so much more impossible that that happened with Adam's. I want to to share one of Megan's books that she's doing for, um, for, with the kids. He breaks down, I I, I love equations, right? And he breaks down just a little bit of what it means for these things just to happen. He says each protein, each DNA, each RNA molecule is very large and complex. Let us consider the probability of the production of one single protein molecule just by chance. Proteins are long chains, and the links in the chains are called amino acids. There are 20 different kinds of amino acids in proteins. In order to make a particular protein or hemoglobin, the amino acids in each protein have to be arranged in precise order. The average protein has 400 amino acids. Although although some have over 2,000 amino acids, and a few have less than 100, but never less than 50. In order to make it easier to calculate, instead of a protein with 400 amino acids in it, let us calculate, calculate the probability of producing, by chance, a protein with only 100 amino acids in it. In order to help you understand the laws of probability, let us think for a moment about another problem. If 17 people were asked to line up in a certain order, then rearrange themselves in a different order, then do it again and again and again. How many times could they line up without lining up twice in the same order? Perhaps a thousand times? Maybe a million times. The truth is the 17 people could line up over 355 trillion times without lining up twice in the same order. That's just 17 people. Mm. 355 trillion if I wrote down the names of 17 people on a piece of paper and they didn't know what, was the, what the order was, they would have only one chance out of 355 trillion of lining up in the right order. And if only one person were added for a total of 18 people, they would have only one chance out of 6 quadrillion 390 trillion of lining up in the right order. It sounds like we're kids talking about how much you love ice cream. I love it a trillion billion times, right? Listen to this. He says, in the, above, in, the, in the above example, we are talking about the chances of lining up only 17 or 18 in a certain order by chance. But in a protein with 100 million, 100 amino acids, you have to line up 100 things in precise order. In this case, however, there are only 20 different kinds of amino acids. The answer is obtained by multiplying 1 one 20th times itself 100 times. The answer turns out to be one chance out of, that is, this number is a one followed by 130 zeros. It is flat out impossible. DNA and RNA molecules are even more complex than proteins. Here, one more thing. Sir Freud Hoyle, in one of his most famous, is, is one of the Earth's most famous astronomers. For most of his life, he did not believe in God or creation. A few years ago, he and his friend, Professor Chandra wait, Wickenschmang, also a well-known astronomer and an evolutionist who was also an atheist, became interested in the problem of the origin of life. Assuming that the Earth was 5 billion years old, they calculated the probability of life evolving on Earth sometime during that 5 billion years. The probability turned out to be one chance out of the number one followed by 40,000 zeros. Of course, that meant that there was no possibility at all. So they turned to outer space and conjectured that there are possibly 100 billion galaxies in the universe and perhaps 100 billion stars in the galaxy. Hoyle said that the probability of evolution is equal to the probability of a tornado sweeping through a junkyard and would assemble a Boeing 747. Sir Fred Hoyle and Professor W. are no longer atheists. They said that wherever life exists in the universe, it had to have been created. Therefore, there must be a God. So the chances that a bacteria just formed into... A fish, and that fish jumped out of the water 
and grew lungs, and then grew feet, and then grew liver. And we haven't even gotten to that yet. We're just talking about protein and acids. It is so complex that even the scientific community looks on it when they're actually honest with it. It's impossible. It sure does seem like creation points to a creator and the design points to the designer. Let's keep going. Then God said, let the earth bring forth the living creatures according to its kind, cattle and creeping things and beasts of the earth, each according to its kind. And it was so. And God made the beast of the earth according to its kind, cattle according to its kind, and everything that creeps on the earth according to its, its kind. And God saw that it was good. Pause right there for a minute. Each according to its kind. We're going to talk more about these animals when we get to Noah. But for now, just chew on the fact that the design, it points to a designer. When we look at different things that animals can do and different things that humans can do, it is almost impossible not to believe that there's a creator. The emperor penguin, for instance. Some of the, the, the facts about an emperor penguin and how they reproduce, it's just, let me just read it to you. <clears throat> So the emperor penguin, this bird's wings, they have short flippers designed for swimming through the water. Its feet, used for steering, are at the very end of the penguin's body, not under the middle, as in other birds. Penguins also have unusual feathers. They're long and thin, but with fluffy tufts at their base. The tufts form a mat that wind and water cannot penetrate. The coat of feathers covers more of the bird's body than do the feathers on other birds. Also, under the feather coat, penguins alone have a layer of blubber or thick fat. Penguins are so well protected that instead of suffering from the cold of the, of the Antarctic, they are, they are more in danger of overheating. But one of the most amazing things about penguins is their breeding pattern. A large bird spend the summer at sea feeding in March. Adults come ashore on sea ice and walk as far as 90 miles for their breeding grounds. For two months, they search for a mate. Once they have a mate, they wait until the female has laid her egg a single very large egg. These birds lay eggs on the ice because there's no material from which to make nests. How can the penguin keep its egg from freezing? Listen to this. The emperor penguin has a fold of feathered skin hanging down from its belly. The female rolls the egg up on her feet and covers it with the fold of her skin. Immediately, the male comes to the female and takes the egg onto his feet, hiding it beneath the fold of feathered skin. This is going to crack some moms and dads up. The female then leaves, hurrying back to the water. She feeds for nearly two months. Wouldn't that be wild, dads? The moms just gave birth and said, I'm out of here. <laughs> Going on a girl's trip. <clears throat> female then leaves, hurrying back to the water. Then she feeds for nearly two months while the, man while the male penguins just stands waiting for the egg, waiting for that egg balanced on his feet to hatch. And just when the egg does hatch, the female returns. She is just in time. She recognizes her mate and chick from hundreds of thousands of penguins standing on the ice and feeds the chick half-digested fish. This feeding literally saves the chick's life. If the female were only a day or two late, the chick would die. Now the male is free to hurry to the sea. He gorges himself for two weeks, but then he too returns to the chick. Now it's the father's turn to arrive just in time. Although thousands of chicks now stand together, the male penguin recognizes its offspring and feeds it from the fish, from the fish stored in his crop and stomach. For the rest of the winter, the parents make turns going off to fish and bringing back food for their youngster. If at any time the parent were a day or so late, the chick would die. How did they do that? 
Are you telling me that it just, they just, you know, that it came from the, the, you know, from this type of fish, and then it formed, and then the penguins looked on and went, you know what? I could really use a little bit more blubber here, and so I'm just gonna, I'm gonna evolve myself into it, and then, hey, you take off, but, you, but you gotta remember, you know, forget about me. I need like two weeks. Okay, how much is two weeks? Is, are we talking about thirteen days? How do they do that? It's super hard without God, right? There's just, there's no way. You guys want one more fun fact about animals? I'm going to take that as a yes. <clears throat> okay, listen to this one. This one's just wild to me, and it's, it's, not as, um, it's not as long. Modern airplanes navigate electronically. They pick up radio signals. Let me make sure this is the right one. Yep. <clears throat> they pick up radio signals or satellites and complicated equipment translate the sig- signals to tell the pilot his or her location. But for years, we have known that birds can navigate, navigate across the great distances without such mechanical aids. In one test of this, of this incredible ability, a number of um, Mannix shearwaters, which nest off the coast of Wales, were tagged and released at different points far beyond their usual range. One was turned loose in Boston, some 3,200 miles from home. In just 12 and a half days, the bird returned to its nest. My wife is going to ask why I can't do that when I go to Kroger, right? I, I just, you know, well, I had to stop here and I had to stop here. This guy is straight shot. In just 12 12 and a half days, the bird returned to its nest, having traveled about 250 miles a day, starting from a place thousands of miles away where it had never been before. What's more, based on the known speed of the bird, it must have flown directly home across the open ocean. How? No one knows. But the navigation system of this and other birds seem better than any mechanical system human beings have ever developed. Come on, man. Birds are better at navigation than us. How? How, 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 how does that just happen? It's impossible to think about without our creator, right? Okay, let's move on to the, to the next day of creation here. Then God said, and this is the best part. This is hopefully all of our favorite days. And God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea over the birds of the air and over every creature that moves on the earth. And God said, see, I've given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of the earth. And every tree whose fruit yields seed to you, it shall be for food. Also to every beast of the earth, to every bird of the earth, of the air, and everything that creeps on the earth in which there is life, I've given every green herb for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he made, and indeed it was very good. So evening and morning were the sixth day. Amazing. This is remarkable. God looked over all of creation and he said, let's do something different. God said, let us. You should circle that or underline that. Because who's the us? God's talking to himself. In this section, we also see that genders are defined. Listen, he says male and female, he created them. Now, this is a problem for some. But I urge you to know that just because it's the truth, and it's going to offend people, doesn't mean that we shouldn't speak it. He created them male and female. He didn't create anything different. He didn't say, hey, I'm going to make this male, and then they're going to, Transition on over. He said they are male and female. He says, I'm going to make them in our image. Now the word for image in Hebrew is teslem, T-S-E-L-E-M, which means an object similar to something. 
representative of it. The word is used elsewhere as statues or replicas. The Latin phrase is imago Dei. Really neat phrase. The Greek word for image is icon. Um, fun little fact, we used to be a part of a ministry in Fort Lauderdale called Icon. And a guy came, this big Bible student, and he says, you guys are actually all pronouncing it it's wrong. It's Econ. And I said, well, it would be pretty tough to have a ministry called Econ, so we'll just stick with Icon. But the image, you know, this, this, this phrase is just really neat. It's really cool to chew on for a minute. We are made in the image of God. We're the Imago Dei. Think about that for a minion, for a minute. First, everything that has been made so far was not made in the image of God. That means that it wasn't given dominion. You go, okay, well, why does that matter? Okay, well, we're to believe that we came from apes. Now, not only is there no proof of anything in between an ape and a human, there's no transition, not even fossils. But when was the last time that a government was set up to be run by apes? When was the last time a lion was put on trial? You go, Ben, that's so silly. If that's where we came from, how do you draw the line for government and rights? Nobody on the planet of the earth based any kind of government off of a transition from animal to human. We would call that silly. We would call that insane. Right. We all know this to be true. All governments are based off of human beings because we have dominion. Second, being made in the image of God means that we are to reflect the likeness of God. Every human being that we made, that we meet, is made in the image of God. That means the Christian should be number one, better than anybody else in respecting other human beings because every single human being is made in the image of God. That's why we should struggle with murder and rape and assault. Why? Because these are other human beings that are made in God's image. So we should fight for them. Now we can't go too far and we can't make ourselves into God. That's, all, that's a whole other message. But we are made in his image. We are his image bearers. And what's really neat, guys, is that it answers some of life's toughest questions. Who am I? Why am I here? What was I created for? What was my, what's my purpose? Some of the toughest questions that human beings could ever ask are all answered right here. Who am I? You're an image bearer. That's who you are. You were created in the image of God. What's my purpose? To have dominion over creatures, to fill the earth. That's our purpose. That's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to be having dominion, ruling the earth, not abusive, ruling the earth. We should be good stewards. What was I created for? We were created to give God glory. Ephesians 2.10 says, We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We all have a purpose. Every single one of us, God has work for us to do. And in Ephesians, it says that God prepared that work for us that we should walk in them. It means that each one of us has a purpose that God has created us for, and only we can walk in that work. So if you take every single person in this room, it's an amazing thing to think about that God has a plan and a purpose for each one of us. So here's where we close. So we're made in God's image. You say, that's awesome. But what about in the next upcoming weeks when we learn about the fall? Does it tarnish our image? A little bit. We're going to see that the image of God is going to change a little bit. Our bodies will change a little bit. Death, sickness, murder will quickly come into the earth. So the image of God will change a little bit. But what's awesome is it didn't end there. Because Jesus Christ came to rescue us. He came to save us. 
And he is available to each and every one of us. And what's wild is we read in the book of Revelation that we will get new bodies. And we will go back to this place of reflecting God's image. So we'll close there for this week. Genesis chapter 1. Awesome chapter of the Bible. The designer knows his design. The thing that's most difficult for us is, do you believe it? You are made in his image. Every single one of us, you're made in the image of God. You are precious in his sight. You are loved. He made you for his glory. You are made with a purpose. We all have things to do. He's also given you work to do. And I hope that each one of us will work in it. Let's pray. Or walk in it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time in Genesis chapter 1. Sometimes, God, science and experiences that we've had in school can be difficult to put together with Genesis chapter 1 in creation. But God, the more and more that we dig into it, we realize that you love science. That your word, it points to science. And we can have both. And so we're thankful for it. I pray for each and every one of us today, Lord. I pray that we would know that we are made in God's image. That you have a plan for our lives and you have work for us to do. I pray that you would bless us as we leave. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys.